Chapter 10, Rotation. Things, in my humble opinion, start to get a lot more interesting. The study of rotational kinematics and rotational dynamics means we get to examine stuff like wheels, engines, motors, planets, and many other practical and exotic examples. A lot of what we're going to cover in this chapter is directly analogous to what you've already studied. One interesting wrinkle, however, is we're going to use radians instead of degrees. There's a reason for this. A lot of derivations are based on radian measure, and it's often easier to work with radians versus degrees. You're looking at a great visual. I refer to this as the birth of a radian. Watch as this radius sweeps out to fall along the circumference of the circle. The angle subtended by this pie slice looking area is one radian. One radian is what you get when this pie slice has its arc length equal to one radius. Understanding the true meaning of a radian is essential. Make sure you understand what a radian really is and go beyond conversion factors. Okay, let's look at the rotational kinematics variables. These are analogous to the translational kinematics variables that you studied in chapters two and four, one-dimensional and two-dimensional linear or translational kinematics. This egg-shaped object is meant to represent an arbitrary shaped solid body. So in boxes one, two, and three, study the definition of angular position, angular displacement, and average angular velocity. These correspond to position, displacement, and average velocity in the linear world. Special note, CCW means counterclockwise. Unless otherwise noted, anything that moves counterclockwise will be taken as positive. Anything that moves clockwise will be taken as negative. Boxes 4, 5, and 6 describe instantaneous angular velocity, average angular acceleration, and instantaneous angular acceleration. Once again, you've seen all this before. Now you're looking at the rotational version. Rotational or angular, those terms are used synonymously. In box 4, that's not a W, that's Greek letter omega. In box 5, that's not a regular A or a fish symbol, that's Greek letter alpha. If you're dealing with a situation where you know the angular acceleration is constant, you get to work with the big five again. Here are the same big five equations modified to represent angular variables. There is a linkage between the linear world and the angular world. Box one links linear distance and angular displacement. Box two links linear speed and angular speed. Box five links linear acceleration with angular acceleration. Box three and four introduce the the very special term known as period the time for one cycle. Box four provides an expression for period in terms of linear velocity as well as angular velocity, omega. Box six provides the expression for centripetal acceleration, which we know and love. You remember centripetal acceleration equals V squared over R. Here's another equivalent expression. Centripetal acceleration, also known as radial acceleration, as in along the radius line, hence the subscript R, is equivalently given by r omega squared. Box 7 gives you the expression for net acceleration. We now have two flavors of acceleration, tangential and radial. Tangential acceleration is also known as linear or translational acceleration. Radial acceleration is also known as centripetal acceleration. So both of those need to get blended together. Now we switch gears. Boxes one through eight show the derivation for rotational kinetic energy as opposed to translational or linear kinetic energy. Look at the picture at the top left. I refer to this as a blob of solidified pancake batter. It's a solid object though, that's important to note. Box seven provides the definition of rotational kinetic energy for a single point. Make sure this really makes sense to you. This is the fundamental building block. All objects can be modeled as one or more points. So if you know how to deal with an individual point, you can use integral calculus to deal with any shaped object. Once again, really make sure you understand how we got to box seven and eight. Box nine introduces a brand new unit. The unit for inertia is the kilogram meter squared. The units for rotational kinetic energy, if you do dimensional analysis, works out to be kilograms meter meters squared times radian squared per second squared. But note, technically speaking, 
the radian is not a unit. I include it in box 10 as a placeholder. Because the radian is a ratio, not a unit, box 10 is more accurately read as a kilogram meter squared per second squared, which is the same as a joule. And we would hope that the units for rotational kinetic energy are exactly the same as the units for translational kinetic energy, the joule. Box 11 is a more formal definition for inertia. DM refers to the mass of the differential element. R refers to the distance between that differential mass element and the axis of rotation. This is again why it's so important to understand how we express the rotational inertia for a single point. If you know how to do that, then you're in good shape to calculate the inertia for more complex geometries. Here are two great insights. The inertia of an object depends on its mass, shape, and location of the rotation axis. Regular old inertia just depended on mass. It didn't depend on shape or any kind of rotation axis. In other words, to calculate rotational inertia, you need to worry about the mass and the distribution of that mass with respect to an axis of rotation. Rotational inertia is an object's resistance to a change in its angular acceleration. We had that exact same statement earlier when we said an object's inertia is a measure of its resistance to a change in its translational or linear acceleration. Here are nine basic geometric shapes. Think of them as building blocks for more complicated or realistic shapes. We're going to use the definition for the rotational inertia of a single point as the basis to derive the rotational inertia for two of these nine basic geometric objects. Let's start with a stick also known as a uniform rigid rod. This derivation is very reusable. This is the essence of calculus in physics, at least at this level. The technique you learn in this derivation is definitely going to be recyclable to other applications. Let's take this stick, again, more formally known as a uniform rigid rod, and call the axis it's spinning around, also known as its axis of rotation, the Y prime axis. I don't know what the rotational inertia is of a rod, but I do know what the rotational inertia is for a point. So I will identify a differential infinitesimally small point, express the rotational inertia for it, and then integrate. That's the overarching theme. Identify a single differential point and capture it in an integral that reflects the object's geometric and material properties. In other words, it's properties that are easily measured. I can measure geometry using a ruler. I can measure mass using a scale. Okay, so spent a lot of quality time really digesting boxes one through eight. To repeat, this approach is very recyclable. You're going to apply it again in this course, in Physics 212, and in subsequent engineering courses. Knowing how to derive expressions makes you a stronger thinker and a better problem solver. Box eight captures the basic integral that I need to deal with. Once again, it's expressed in terms of the object's material and geometric properties. That's your guiding light. You just need to set up an integral that does that and also is integratable. Box 11 shows the expression for the rotational inertia of a uniform rigid rod as it rotates around that Y prime axis. The rotational inertia of a point was a key building block here. This rod now in turn becomes a key building block for other more complicated or realistic objects. Let's do this one more time. It's time to derive the rotational inertia of a uniform solid cylinder. This is an especially interesting and helpful object. Solid cylinders are the basic building blocks for a lot of practical devices and in many practical applications. Instead of a differential point element, I'm selecting a differential area element. Remember, the big picture thinking here is to identify a point element and associate that point element's material and geometric properties properties in an integral that's integratable. My differential ring element that you see here is in fact a point because it's infinitesimally small. I know the rotational inertia of a point, it's simply mr squared, so my job is to cleverly add up all of these differential ring elements that comprise this object. Study boxes 1 through 7. 
This derivation technique, just like the last one, is really reusable. Special note for box four, rho, Greek letter rho, is mass divided by volume. Capital letter M divided by capital letter V refers to the entire object's mass divided by the entire object's volume. dm over dv is the differential mass of the identified point element divided by the differential volume. If this is a uniformly dense object, I can say big M over big V does equal dm over dv. That's only if it's uniformly dense. We did the same thing for a uniform rigid rod in boxes one, two, and three. This again is capturing the elements, material, and geometric properties. Here's the rest of the derivation. Solid cylinders are really common and really important building blocks. One half mr squared is a really well-known rotational inertia expression. What happens if I take an object and spin it around a different axis of rotation? This blue line represents an axis of rotation going through the object's center of mass. What happens if I offset the this axis. If I create an alternative axis of rotation that's parallel to the center of mass axis but offset by some distance, it's still parallel but it's not going through the object's center of mass. This derivation is based on all those dimensions you see shown at the right. That red X represents the intersection between the object and its axis of rotation that's going through its center of mass. Point O is the point at which the offset parallel axis is intersecting the same object. It's parallel to the axis of rotation going through the object's center of mass, but it's offset by a distance d. Same approach, we identify a differential point element because we know how to deal with a point element. Its inertia is simply mr squared, and we proceed to capture it in an integral. Boxes 1 through 7 derive the parallel axis theorem Next section, torque. This is a general introduction to torque. We're going to revisit it again in chapter 11 at a much deeper level. Torque is an influence which tends to change the rotational motion of an object. Let's say your goal is to loosen this hex nut using this crescent wrench. You exert this dark blue force at this point indicated here. There's a lot of dimensions and angles indicated here and they all mean something. Torque is the product of perpendiculars. We remember previously that the dot product gave us the product of parallels. Torque is again the product of perpendiculars, where one of the pair is the force and the other pair is the torque arm. A torque will tend to rotate an object either clockwise or counterclockwise, so we need box 4 again. We consider counterclockwise as positive and clockwise as negative. Box 5 is a common stumbling block for a lot of students, the line of action. The line of action determines the torque arm. Three terms mean the same thing. Lever arm, moment arm, torque arm all mean the same thing. They all refer to the shortest distance between the axis of rotation and the line of action. There's a lot of geometry going on here, so make sure you really study the picture in box one. Torque is the product of perpendiculars, specifically the product of the applied force and its associated torque arm. Box number seven provides a simple recipe to calculate torque. Number one, you identify the force vector and its magnitude F indicated by this red vector shown here. Number two, identify the axis of rotation. In this case, it's perpendicular to the screen and shown here. Number three, identify the point where the force is applied. Number four, identify the position vector that starts on the axis of rotation and terminates at the point of the force application. Number five, determine the angle between this force vector and the position vector. Number six, calculate torque. All of this might look pretty heavy at first glance, but it's basically organizing you into finding the two vectors, the applied force vector and the torque arm, multiplying them together and multiplying by the sine of the angle between them. The sine function captures perpendicularity. Remember, torque is the product of perpendiculars. The magnitude of the force times the torque arm times the sine of the angle between those two vectors. Next section, Newton's second law in angular form. 
we all know about F equals MA. The counterpart to that is torque equals I alpha. So F equals MA is analogous to torque equals I alpha. Boxes one through seven are going to lend a lot of insight, so go through them carefully. So you have two ways of looking at torque. Torque is the product of perpendiculars, and also torque equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration. Just to really stress their symmetry one more time, F equals MA is analogous to tau equals I alpha. To conclude, let's look again at work, power, and kinetic energy. Box number one shows the definition of work that is now extended to include force times distance and torque times angular displacement. Box number two calculates power when you have an applied torque. And box number three is an updated version of the work kinetic energy theorem.